Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. You all know that the functional unit of the kidney is the nephron. And at the very beginning of the nephron, we have this structure called the glomerulus, which is basically a tuft of capillaries that filters contents of the blood into what's called the Bowman's capsule. And from there, those contents can enter the tubules of the kidney and either get excreted or reabsorbed. The kidney kind of takes over from there and does its magic. So this glomerulus that we're talking about, it basically has one job, and it's to act as a sieve. And you wouldn't think it's that hard. The job is to keep in the big stuff, so keep the proteins in the blood, and to let go of the water and the solutes and kind of let the tubules do the rest. Well, if you've been in medical school long enough, you'll realize that if we have a body part, no matter how small it is, it can get damaged. And so the glomerulus is no exception to this rule. And so, of course, the glomerulus can get damaged, and that's why we have a group of diseases that we call glomerular diseases. Glomerular diseases are generally categorized into two different categories. So nephritic, nephrotic. I kind of think of these as potato, potato. And I only say that because these diseases do occur sort of on a spectrum, okay? And I realize that that idea can get a little bit confusing. I also realize that there are a lot of glomerular diseases and it's hard to keep track of which ones fall under which category. So I'm here to simplify nephritic versus nephrotic as much as I can. Basically, what I want you to take away from this episode is that nephritic and nephrotic syndromes are defined by specific findings and specific pathogenesis, which we will discuss, okay? And I want you to understand that in real life, nephritic and nephrotic syndromes do occur on a spectrum and they can often coexist. However, that said, for the boards, there are several glomerular diseases that you need to learn. And personally, I think they're a lot easier to learn if you divide them into nephritic versus nephrotic categories. And then for each disease, there's, of course, certain buzzwords and classic presentations that are associated with each. Okay, so just to summarize, we're going to talk in this episode about how nephritic and nephrotic syndromes occur on a spectrum talk about what their definitions are, talk about how they're, how they come to be. And then we're going to recognize that they're on a spectrum, but then we're still going to divide them into two categories and discuss specific diseases that fall under each category. Most of our time, we're going to spend working through several vignettes and then filling in details about the different glomerular diseases. Does that sound good? I certainly hope so. So, Remember, as I go through these vignettes, do your best to try and follow along with them and think about the answer. As always, if you don't know, don't worry, okay? We're going to try and explain as much as we can as we go along and try to make it make sense to you so that you'll remember it in the long term. Before we get into any actual cases, I'd like to break down nephritic versus nephrotic syndrome a little bit. But even before that, I think it's really important when we're studying glomerular diseases to recall the structure of the glomerulus, okay? So think about that picture in your head for a little bit. I'll try to paint that verbally. So remember, in the glomerulus, the afferent arterial enters, and then we have this kind of convoluted tuft of capillaries surrounded by the Bowman's capsule, and that's where all the filtration happens. And from there, an efferent arterial is going to leave, okay? Now, Within that tuft of capillaries, immediately beyond a fenestrated endothelium, we have this glomerular basement membrane, okay? And do you remember what's beyond the basement membrane even? So these are the little podocytes, okay? These are, remember, the negatively charged podocytes, and they use that charge to actually act as a barrier as well and keep other negatively charged things like proteins, for instance, from going through. Now, when we talk about glomerular disease, it's damage to some component of that glomerulus. So it could either be that glomerular basement membrane or it could be to the podocytes, okay? And 
where the damage is determines what is going to pass through that shouldn't. So blood versus proteins. So now with that prologue in mind, I'm now going to ask you guys, what is nephritic syndrome? Nephritic syndrome occurs after usually damage to the glomerular basement membrane, and mainly it causes leakage of red blood cells leading to hematuria. If you associate nephritic syndrome with hematuria, I think you're in a great place because that's really the main finding. And the reason we get that hematuria is because the basement membrane is not able to retain the blood cells because it's damaged. Of course, this does beg the question, do we see any proteinuria in nephritic syndrome? And the answer is yes. You would expect that if the glomerular basement membrane is damaged, then a little bit of protein is going to leak through as well. Remember, mainly the podocytes are really great at keeping the proteins in because they have that negative charge, but a few proteins can still leak through the glomerular basement membrane as well. And so the proteinuria that we see in nephritic syndrome is generally considered to be in what's called the subnephrotic range because nephrotic syndrome is defined as a certain amount of proteinuria. So what is that subnephrotic range? What's kind of the cutoff? It's 3.5 grams per day. So if less than 3.5 grams of protein are leaking in the urine per day, then that's subnephrotic proteinuria, and that's what we would expect to see in nephritic syndrome. Now, can we get additional damage to the glomerular basement membrane, so much so that even more protein passes? Or in addition to glomerular basement membrane damage, can we also get additional damage to the podocytes that causes leakage of protein? The answer to to both those questions is absolutely yes. And so that's what I was talking about earlier with that spectrum of nephritic and nephrotic. You can definitely have nephritic pathology. And if additional superimposed damage happens on top of that, you can end up with not only hematuria, but also proteinuria that is over 3.5 grams per day and is now considered in the nephrotic range. And so at that point, you'd have both a nephritic and a nephrotic picture. So I hope that kind of clarifies that in nephritic syndrome, we see hematuria and we also see a small amount of proteinuria, so less than 3.5 grams per day. What are some other findings that you would expect for nephritic syndrome? So one of the big ones is hypertension. Anyone know why we see hypertension? Hypertension happens because of salt retention, okay? The renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system gets activated, especially in situations of chronic glomerulonephritis, or if there's renal ischemia, that can be a potent stimulator of the RAS system. And so when that gets activated, we have salt retention and we get hypertension in nephritic syndrome. And now... Another thing that you should know in any glomerular disease is the presence of casts. So casts indicate either damage to the glomerulus or the tubules. And so what type of casts would we see in nephritic syndrome? We'd see red blood cell casts, right? Because we were seeing hematuria, so you'd see red blood cells on their own, but you'd also see those red blood cell casts, which indicate that the blood cells have traversed through the tubules because that's how the casts form. Now, let's move on to talk about nephrotic syndrome. So, what is nephrotic syndrome? Nephrotic syndrome is defined as massive range proteinuria, which means proteinuria that's exceeding 3.5 grams per day. That's nephrotic range proteinuria. Usually, we get nephrotic syndrome as a result of damage to what structure? Podocytes, okay? The podocytes have that negative charge, and so if we have damage to them, then we no longer have that charge barrier, and a lot of protein can leak into the urine. That is the key finding in nephrotic syndrome. Now, when we have protein leaking into the urine, especially massive amounts, over 3.5 grams per day, what does the urine look like? 
it's described as frothy urine, okay? And I think it's a little gross to think about it, but if we have protein in the urine, then that might even be in the question stem, that the patient says that their urine looks frothy, or on UA, it looks frothy. That's an indicator that there's protein in there. So what are some other symptoms of nephrotic syndrome? Well, we're losing protein, and so we often get hypoalbuminemia because that's an important protein in the blood, and that too can leak out if the podocytes aren't working. And with hypoalbuminemia, an associated finding is edema. Why do we see edema? We see edema because albumin acts as an oncotic agent in the blood vessels, so it actually helps to keep water in. And if we don't have as much albumin, then that oncotic force is lowered and a lot of water can then extravasate into the interstitium causing edema. Okay, so we have hypoalbuminemia and as a result of that we have edema. What else do we see in nephrotic syndrome? I feel like nephrotic is a little more exciting because we see more things. So hyperlipidemia is another symptom and anyone know why hyperlipidemia happens? So it's interesting. Actually, as a response to the hypoalbuminemia, that decreased oncotic force, the liver can actually start increasing lipogenesis. So basically, there's not as much protein in the blood and the liver's like, I don't know what to do. And so it starts dumping lipids into the blood. And that's why we get hyperlipidemia. Okay. So hyperlipidemia is actually the liver making up for the hypoalbuminemia, which I think is pretty interesting. And then there's one more key finding in nephrotic syndrome. Can you think about what that is? It actually leads to a hypercoagulable state. Why would that be? So we talked about how you can lose proteins. And so another protein that is often lost is antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3, exactly what it sounds like, prevents clotting. And so if we lose that, then we end up in a hypercoagulable state. So a lot of the symptoms that we see in nephrotic syndrome are a result of the proteins that are leaking through the urine. And now what type of casts would you expect to see in nephrotic syndrome? We see fatty casts, okay? And in, within the fatty casts, if you look microscopically, you can see oval fat bodies. So you can remember that because think that there's a hyperlipidemia in nephrotic syndrome, and so we see fatty casts. So the takeaway between nephritic and nephrotic. For nephritic syndrome, think damage to the glomerular basement membrane, hematuria, hypertension, and a small amount of proteinuria. For nephrotic syndrome, think damage to the podocytes, leakage of proteins resulting in hypoalbuminemia, edema, hyperlipidemia, and hypercoagulability. In nephritic syndrome, we see red blood cell casts. In nephrotic syndrome, we generally see fatty casts. Nephritic syndrome and nephrotic syndrome can definitely occur together with damage to both of those components. Or nephritic syndrome can progress to nephrotic range proteinuria, with enough damage to the glomerular basement membrane. And so they do occur in real life on a spectrum. As I said earlier though, for the boards, when we talk about the specific glomerular diseases, I definitely think it's a lot easier to just divide them into categories of nephritic versus nephrotic. We understand that they occur on a spectrum, but we learn them in these categories because that's kind of how they're going to show up on the test. Okay? So for these glomerular diseases on the test, we're going to see questions that present a vignette and they require you to recognize which specific disease is going on. And usually you have to know something else about that disease to be able to answer the question. So you see a vignette, know what disease is going on, and then it's going to be a second or third order question about that disease. I'm going to work through these diseases one at a time and try and present a vignette similar to what's asked on the boards, and then we'll get into more specifics about each disease and try and understand why things are going on in that disease so that you can hopefully remember them more easily. Let's start with the nephritic diseases. So I've seen different mnemonics 
for these groups of diseases to try and remember all the diseases that fall under the nephritic category. But when you're taking a multiple choice exam, you don't really need to be able to list off all the diseases, but what you should be able to do is recognize the names of these diseases, okay? So for the nephritic diseases, you can recognize them because all the names have the word glomerulonephritis in it, okay? So it's like glomerulonephritic, but the last letter is changed, so it's glomerulonephritis, all right? There's only two exceptions to this rule, and those are IgA nephropathy and Alport syndrome, okay? So in IgA nephropathy, you actually have IgA attacking the basement membrane, and in Alport syndrome, you have a mutation in the type 4 collagen that makes up the basement membrane. So for that TLDR, or I guess I should say TLDL, too long, didn't listen, recognize nephritic diseases because their names always have glomerulonephritis in them. The only exceptions to this rule are IgA nephropathy and Alport syndrome. So now let's talk through some vignettes. Our first vignette is about a seven-year-old boy with two days of periorbital edema, cola-colored urine, and hypertension. He has no significant medical history except for remote history of ear infections, and he was treated for pharyngitis about two weeks ago. His labs show hematuria, proteinuria, and decreased C3. His diagnosis? So this young boy has post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, okay? How do we know that it's post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis? We got that key piece of history, which was that he was treated for pharyngitis about two weeks ago. It was likely streptococcal pharyngitis from group A streptococcal species. What if I described a skin infection with honey-colored crusting in his history rather than that pharyngitis? So that's impetigo, okay? It's also caused by group A strep, and it can also lead to post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So remember that PSGN, or post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, can happen either after strep pharyngitis or after impetigo. Now, how did you know that he has a nephritic condition? His symptoms were pretty important. So he had cola-colored urine, which is indicative of hematuria. He had hypertension as well. And remember, they're not going to say that he has hypertension. They're probably going to give you the actual blood pressure with his vitals. So make sure you pay attention to that. And then he also has edema. Why does he have the edema again? Remember, you also lose protein in nephritic syndromes. And even though it's slight, especially around the orbit where the skin is very thin, I think it's more obvious there. And so periorbital edema is pretty classic for PSGN. Now, what causes PSGN? So yeah, we said infection with group A strep species. And that actually triggers an immune reaction. So these patients, you can actually test them for certain antibodies like anti-DNA B. The immune, the antibodies that are generated immunologically during the strep infection can actually form subepithelial immune complexes and deposit in the glomerular basement membrane. Those deposits of antibodies actually end up consuming complement, and so you get decreased C3 as well. Now, what type of hypersensitivity would this be if you have immune complexes depositing in the basement membrane? It's a type 3 hypersensitivity. Something else you should know about glomerular diseases is what findings you would see on different types of imaging. So light microscopy is one. What would you see on light microscopy? You generally see hypercellular glomeruli. So they might show you a picture of this. And basically, hypercellular means there's a lot of cells and it looks like the glomerulus is very crowded. And so that's a clue that this is PSGN. What would you see on immune fluorescence? So for PSGN, immune fluorescence generally shows either a starry sky or granular or lumpy, bumpy appearance. And all of these words are hinting at the same thing, which is deposition of antibodies and complement in the basement membrane, and it makes it look lumpy, bumpy or granular or like a starry sky. Okay? Okay. 
And so that is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. That's a very important one and it shows up a lot. So I would know that one really well. Let's move on now to case two. Case two is about a 30-year-old male who presents with hematuria. Just last week, he started to develop some, tr- some symptoms of upper respiratory infection, but otherwise he's been asymptomatic. He has had previous episodes of hematuria before. What is his diagnosis? So this gentleman, with the recent history of a URI and previous history of similar episodes of hematuria, probably has IgA nephropathy, also known as Berger disease. So in IgA nephropathy, we get IgA immune complexes that deposit in the mesangium, okay? And it's very classic for it to present as hematuria following some kind of infection, either an upper respiratory or a GI infection. Why would upper respiratory and GI infections specifically lead to this disease with the hematuria? So it's IgA nephropathy, right? And IgA is, it's usually secretory IgA. So it's found on mucous membranes that are in the respiratory system or in the GI system. And so those are the types of infections that increase this IgA and cause IgA nephropathy. Which vasculitis is associated with IgA deposition? Henoch-Schonlein purpura, if you remember that, awesome. So remember, Henoch-Schonlein purpura is a vasculitis that's associated with abdominal pain, the palpable purpura, and also the arthralgias, and it can also have renal involvement. So Berger disease, or IgA nephropathy, is the renal version of the Henoch-Schonlein purpura. Same pathogenesis, those IgA antibodies. Now on to our third case of nephritic syndrome. So think about a 24-year-old male with glomerulonephritis, and his history is positive for lens dislocation as well as deafness. What's his diagnosis? Alport syndrome. What's Alport syndrome? I said this earlier. So remember, Alport syndrome is a genetic disease, and it's caused by a mutation in type 4 collagen, and that causes thinning and splitting of that glomerular basement membrane. So it affects basement membranes not just in the kidney, but also in the lens and in the cochlea. And so that's why he has lens dislocation and sensory neural deafness. The mnemonic for Alport syndrome is can't pee, can't see, can't hear a B. Okay, so it affects the kidney, the eyes, and the ears. What's the inheritance pattern for Alport syndrome? It's X-linked recessive, which means generally you're going to see it in males. And then how does it appear on the on electron microscopy? It's called a basket weave apparent appearance. Um, basket weave is kind of a buzzword that you need to know. The reason we see that is because there's irregular thinning and thickening of the glomerular basement membrane as a result of that mutation in the collagen. So the collagen is irregular, the basement membrane becomes irregular, and then it looks like a basket weave. The presentation of Alport syndrome, can't pee, can't see, can't hear a bee, that's pretty classic, and so that's probably going to get you to the answer, but sometimes these little buzzwords help. So also remember basket weave. Now our next case is a 42-year-old woman with a history of lupus, And she has a creatinine of 3.8, GFR of 30. Her electron microscopy shows wire looping capillaries. What is her diagnosis? So she has diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, or DPGN, okay? Now, lupus can be associated with a lot of different types of glomerular disease. However... DPGN is the most commonly seen, and unfortunately, it's also the most serious type of glomerular disease. It often causes death in patients with lupus. So the wire looping capillaries on electron microscopy are seen because immune complexes accumulate in the capillary wall. So these are subendothelial deposits. If you want to remember wire looping, think looping, lupus, lupus, 
wire looping, wire lupus, and so they're seen in DPGN, which is the most common glomerular disease in patients with lupus. All right, so we are cruising through these cases. Our next one is a 28-year-old male with a history of opioid abuse who presents with hematuria. On exam, he's hypertensive with peripheral edema, and he has scleral icterus. What's the most likely cause of his hematuria? So this might be pretty tricky. Um, what I'm going for here is membranoproliferative proliferative glomerular nephritis. So his history of opioid abuse, as well as that scleral icterus on exam, with that, I was thinking hepatitis, okay? So hepatitis B and hepatitis C are both associated with type 1 membranoproliferative proliferative glomerulonephritis, or MPGN, okay? The pathognomonic finding on light microscopy of type 1 MPGN is, do you know? It's what's called a tram track appearance. It happens because we have splitting of the basement membrane due to subendothelial immune complexes. So they actually the basement membrane sort of splits and it looks like a tram track appearance. And type 1 MPGN is associated with hepatitis infection. So notice that my vignette didn't give you that, but it gave you clues that he might have hepatitis, like injection drug use with the opioids, as well as scleral icterus, indicating that he had some kind of liver pathology. Now, I said type 1 MPGN, so there must be a type 2, and there is. Do you know what causes type 2 MPGN? The presence of something called C3 nephritic factor. What does C3 nephritic factor do? So this stabilizes uh, the enzyme C3 convertase, and that's what activates C3 by, con by cleaving it into its active forms. And so if you have C3 nephritic factor, then you can imagine that C3 convertase is going to be pretty active, and it's going to be activating complement. What's the pathognomonic light microscopy finding for type 2 MPGN? That would be dense deposits, okay? So intramembranous uh, deposits, and you can think of those deposits as complement because that's getting activated, all right? So just in summary, membranoproliferative proliferative glomerulonephritis is divided into two different types, and type 1 is associated with hep B, hep C infection, and it has that tram track appearance. Type 2 is associated with C3 nephritic factor, and it's associated with dense deposits on light microscopy. Okay, our last case for nephritic syndrome is a 40-year-old male with a recent history of hemoptysis and hematuria. His kidney biopsy shows crescentic glomerulonephritis. What is his diagnosis? So the hemoptysis and hematuria are kind of key for good pasture syndrome. Do you remember what good pasture syndrome is? So this is IgG antibodies against the type 4 collagen in the basement membrane. What do we see on immune fluorescence with IgG? So it's a linear immune fluorescence, okay? And you can contrast that with the granular immune fluorescence that we had in which disease? The post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So in good pastures, we have antibodies against the collagen in the basement membrane. And so the collagen is very smooth, unlike the immune complexes that we see after strep infection. And so because it's smooth, we see a smooth linear immune fluorescence. And that's a picture that they might show you in the vignette. What is our patient's prognosis? So unfortunately, it's not looking very good because he has crescentic glomerulonephritis and you can see pretty clearly on a picture of the glomerulus, there will be a crescent. And if you see that crescent, it's actually called rapidly progressive crescentic glomerulonephritis. So it's not a great prognosis, unfortunately. Now, this happens in good pasture syndrome. And the key thing for good pasture syndrome is the simultaneous onset of hemoptysis and hematuria. Because the antibodies are against the type 4 collagen, not just in the glomerular basement membrane, but also in the membranes in the lung. And so that's why you start coughing up blood and you also start peeing out blood. 
So good pastures can cause rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And other than that, there's two other diseases I want you to think about. So do you guys remember the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies or the ANCAs? Yeah, these ones can cause RPGN as well. So which disease classically affects the upper respiratory, lower respiratory tract, as well as the kidneys? The antibody is called C. anca. That's Wegener's granulomatosis, or I guess the more politically correct version is granulomatosis with polyangitis, okay? That causes that triad of upper respiratory, lower respiratory symptoms, as well as damage to the kidneys. What is C. anca actually against? It's an antibody against antiproteinase 3. And you should associate C. anca with antiproteinase 3 because they can ask you about either one. Now, another anca disease also gives you pulmonary and renal symptoms, but the antibody is P. anca. What's that? So I'm going for microscopic polyangitis, okay? What's the P. anca antibody against? It's antimyeloperoxidase, okay? So P. anca is antimyeloperoxidase. That's seen in microscopic polyangitis. And then C. anca is antiproteinase 3, which is seen in Wegener's granulomatosis. So microscopic polyangitis, Wegener's granulomatosis, and then also good pasture syndrome, these can all cause rapidly progressive crescentic glomerulonephritis. And you can easily identify this because they'll show you a picture of a glomerulus and you'll see a very obvious crescent within that. So good. It's hard to have a sense of time when you're the one talking, um, but hopefully that didn't go terribly slow for you, okay? This next part is going to be quicker, I promise. It's going to be the nephrotic syndromes, okay? So far we've covered the nephritic and now we're moving on to the nephrotic. So just as a quick refresher, nephrotic syndrome was damaged to what part? The podocytes. And it, that interrupted our negatively charged filtration barrier, leading to massive range proteinuria. What was nephrotic range proteinuria again? Over 3.5 grams per day. And again, instead of giving you a mnemonic to remember all the nephrotic syndromes that you need to know, I'm just going to try and help you recognize that it is a nephrotic syndrome. So in the names of these, look for words like sclerosis, nephrosis. You'll also see nephropathy, but don't forget that IgA nephropathy was considered nephritic. Um, and so I'm sorry for that slight overlap there. But in general, sclerosis, nephrosis, things that end in osis, okay? So our first case for nephrotic syndromes is about a five-year-old boy who was brought to the ER because of swelling in his legs and around his eyes. His mom says that he has no significant medical history, um, but he's just recovering from a head cold that he had last week. She describes his urine as frothy. What's his most likely diagnosis? So in a little kid with frothy urine and swelling in his legs indicating nephrotic syndrome, he probably has minimal change disease, okay? Usually, minimal change disease, or MCD, happens after a recent infection or an immunization. There's one more association for MCD, though, besides just some kind of infection. Lymphoma, usually Hodgkin lymphoma, for some reason that can also lead to minimal change disease. So with this, what do we see on light microscopy? It's actually a normal-looking glomerulus, okay? Um, and that, that's why the name comes about, minimal change disease. We don't see much change on the pathology slide. What do we see on electron microscopy? What we see is called effacement of the podocytes, okay, or the foot processes. So the word effacement means thinning or shortening of a tissue. You'll often hear in labor about cervical effacement, um, as indicating that a woman is ready to deliver. And so effacement just means thinning or shortening of the tissue. So with a lot of nephrotic diseases, we'll see effacement of the foot processes, indicating that they're getting shorter and thinner. How do we treat minimal change disease? Fortunately, they're very responsive to steroids, okay? They actually show excellent response to steroids. And so think of minimal change disease 
in little kids happening after some kind of infection or rarely after a lymphoma. And it causes nephrotic syndrome, so they get edema, proteinuria, um, but luckily it responds really well to steroids. Our next case is about an African-American woman who has nephrotic range proteinuria. She's morbidly obese and she was diagnosed with HIV two years ago. What's her most likely diagnosis? So I'm not going to lie, with this little vignette, I was going mainly for risk factors. Her most likely diagnosis is something called focal segmental glomerulonephrosis, or FSGN. So FSGN is a segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis, um, and you can see that on light microscopy, okay? And it's basically nonspecific focal deposits of IgM and complement. So I kind of think of this as polka dots because it's focal segmental. It's not everywhere, and it only happens in small areas. What are the major associations with this? Or risk factors, I guess. So FSGN is the most common type of nephrotic syndrome in African Americans as well as Hispanics. And risk factors are obesity, HIV, which our patient has. Others include heroin abuse as well as sickle cell disease. And then how do you treat these? So you can try steroids. Unfortunately, these have kind of an inconsistent response to steroids. So sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. Our next case for nephrotic syndrome is about a Caucasian male who has nephrotic range proteinuria, and he has a history of hepatitis C. His light microscopy shows diffuse thickening of the glomerular basement membrane, and electron microscopy shows spike in dome subepithelial deposits. What's his diagnosis? I gave you some risk factors, but then I also gave you some important path findings. So this patient has membranous nephropathy, okay? The name for this one definitely helps because it's diffuse thickening of the membranes, which is what we saw on light microscopy, right? And then on electron microscopy, we saw a spike in dome appearance. So where does that come from? The spike in dome appearance refers to how the GBM spikes between deposits of immune complexes, okay? So you have immune complexes, and between those deposits, the GBM kind of looks like it's spiking, and so that's why we have the spike in dome appearance in membranous nephropathy. What were our risk factors for membranous nephropathy? So our patient was Caucasian, and this is the most common nephrotic syndrome in Caucasian adults. It can be seen in patients with lupus, as well as other autoimmune conditions. It can be seen when patients take drugs like NSAIDs, penicillamines, gold. Um, I'm not sure who's ingesting pure gold, but apparently that's a risk factor for membranous nephropathy. And then hepatitis B and hepatitis C can also cause membranous nephropathy. Just to recap, which nephritic disease were hepatitis B and hepatitis C associated with? Yeah, so hep B and hep C were associated with MPGN, membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. They're also associated with membranous nephropathy, which is a nephrotic syndrome. Now, how does membranous nephropathy respond to steroids, which is what we seem to have been using so far? Unfortunately, it's a poor response, okay? So patients with membranous nephropathy don't actually respond that well to steroids. Now, our last case, it's not even a case, okay? This last one's going to be pretty easy. So in diabetes, you can get nephrotic disease. So diabetic glomerulonephropathy. And what is the key finding on light microscopy for diabetic nephropathy? The Kimmel-Steele-Wilson lesions, okay, those represent nodular glomerulosclerosis. And what is the mechanism of damage in diabetes? You need to know Kimmel-Steele-Wilson, but I think the mechanism is a lot more important to know. So what happens is non-enzymatic glycation, okay? We get non-enzymatic glycation preferentially of the efferent arterioles, so remember, the efferent are leaving the glomerulus. If they get glycated, then they actually narrow, and that causes increased GFR 
and expansion of the mesangium because all that protein leaks through and can start depositing in the mesangium. And now, just kind of as a PS, um, I didn't include this as a case, but infiltrative diseases like amyloidosis can also deposit in the kidney and cause nephrotic syndrome. So there you go, guys. I actually stopped counting the cases out loud, but we actually went through 10 cases, not to forget that little PS about amyloidosis. Now for some take-home points. I hope you guys understand that nephritic syndrome is hematuria, usually caused by damage to the glomerular basement membrane, and nephrotic syndrome is proteinuria, caused by effacement or some kind of damage to the podocytes. And then nephritic syndrome is also associated with hypertension. Nephrotic syndrome is associated with hypoalbuminemia, edema, hyperlipidemia, hypercoagulability. In real life, these diseases can happen on a spectrum, and so you can have elements of both nephritic and nephrotic. On the boards, you should be familiar with the classic vignettes of diseases, and I think it helps to organize them in the nephritic and nephrotic categories and make it black and white, even though it isn't black and white in real life, okay? Because if you are able to recognize certain buzzwords and associations, I think that helps you get to the right answer on the exam. Now, When somebody is talking about it or when you're reading it in a book, it seems pretty easy, but the names do get really tricky, okay? So, for example, I used to confuse membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis with membranous nephropathy all the time because they both start with that M. I also used to get those confused with focal segmental. So, remember that if it ends in nephritis, it's probably nephritic. If it ends in something like nephrosis or sclerosis, it's nephrotic. So make sure you solidify these names, also solidify the risk factors and associations in your mind so that you're not thrown off on the exam. And I really think that reviewing information in many different ways, so in a book, on this podcast, in practice questions, that's really important so that you see it in a lot of different ways um, and you're able to recognize the same patterns even though they're not always identical. So Doing more practice questions, reviewing the material in different ways, I really think that's the path to success, not just for this topic, but for any topic. So in conclusion, I hope this review has helped you to solidify some of those details, and I hope that you guys continue to solidify them by other modes of learning. If you have any questions, comments, concerns about what we covered in this segment, please visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and you can post those under the comments for this episode. Thank you so much for your time. I'm always really grateful to anyone who tunes into this series. Um, And then my last little plug, if you have any topic that makes you go, SOS, I need help, feel free to contact us, okay? And you can actually include specific aspects that you want us to go over. And at Spoonful of Sugar, we will definitely try our best to oblige because we'll do anything to help the medicine go down. 